Hello, lovelies. Welcome to the Fat Joy Podcast, where we talk each week about how to flourish in an anti fat world. I'm Sophia, a fat person and professional coach who loves talking to other fat people about what it's like to live within oppressive systems that marginalize our bodies and how we still dare to have the audacity and courage to reach towards our collective liberation and embrace our joy. Please know this is an adult content podcast, so there will be swears, we will be talking about harms we've experienced, and we will be rebelling against diet culture, anti-fatness, ableism, racism, etc. If you'd like to support the Fat Joy podcast and get bonus content as a thank you, please check us out at patreon.com slash fatjoy. I am so glad you're here with us. Enjoy. Hello, lovelies. Welcome back to the Fat Joy Podcast. I'm joined by, let me just tell you, I almost want to do a drum roll. I'm joined by Chrissy King today. Hi, Chrissy. Oh my gosh. Hi. I'm so happy to be here and talking with you today. So exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, of course, have been following you for some time. You have a new book out. We're just, we're going to dive into all of it. And I'm so honored you're here, Chrissy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> Chrissy, why don't you tell us about yourself? Yes. Um, So, yes, my name is Chrissy. I'm currently, I currently reside in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I've been here for about three and a half years. I love it. Um, I am a writer, an educator. I do a lot of my work um, in the wellness industry around creating an anti-racist and inclusive wellness industry. And I do a lot of work around body liberation. I don't talk about any things I talk about without talking about white supremacy and without talking about intersectionality. Um, and I just feel really blessed to be able to share my work with the world and hopefully do it in a way that's creating an impact. Yeah, amazing. I mean, we're again, we're going to dive into this, but even the concept of an anti-racist, inclusive, intersectional wellness industry almost feels like an oxymoron, but I'm here for you to tell me how it's not. So we're going to get into it. But let's start with your relationship to the word fat. Like what kind of hold has this word had on you, your life? I mean, it's led to so much of what you're doing in the world. So tell us a bit about that. Um, I had, when I was growing up, so I always tell people I grew up in the, this is the important part. I grew up in the Midwest. I'm from Wisconsin originally. I grew up in Milwaukee. I was homeschooled until I was in the third grade. I went to a private school in the third grade, uh, in the suburbs. There were only two other black kids in the school, my brother and my sister. There were no other kids. Color. I was five eight in the third grade. I was taller than the teacher. You were five eight in grade three. <laughs> taller than the teacher. Obviously taller than all my classmates. Um, I was like in a sea of like blonde hair and blue eyes, and I felt like a giant, right? And I was just like a bigger person in general. Like I was physically taller, but I was still just bigger person. Um, I had to shop in like the adult clothes section in the third grade. Not cool, you know. It was like. You can't. I wanted to shop at like Justice with all the other, you know, but I was like shopping at on um, Dress Bar. You know what I'm saying? I remember my mom being like, we got to buy walking shorts. I'm like, no, I want my booty shorts like everyone else. But no, that's not, that was not my, that was not my journey. It was not, was not my journey. It was not my journey. I always joked, and so the school, we had to wear skirts to the middle of our knees. And so I always joked that I was dressed like a little secretary, right? I also had like really big feet. And so you couldn't find cute, like, age appropriate shoes for me either. And so I always had this real like negative relationship with being in a bigger body. If you had said the word fat to me when I was like younger, that would have really thrown me off, like really would have thrown me out of sorts because I don't even know where I got this idea, but I just had this idea that if I was going to be tall, that I had to be tall and thin like a model, right? Like I saw like Naomi Campbell was like, you know, there wasn't a lot of representation for black girls back then anyways. Right. And so I saw like Naomi Campbell's like the picture of beautiful, like that, if I could be close to beautiful, be like her. And so that means I need to be tall and thin. Like you don't get to be tall and big and don't definitely don't be tall and fat. Right. Like that is a no in my mind. That was a no, no. And again, I always am so clear that I wasn't getting like reinforcement from this at home. Like my, my, my family didn't talk about bodies or food or any of those things. It was just like, how I felt existing in this space where I didn't see people who looked like me that much. So I had a very bad relationship to the word fat for so long. And one of my first diet, when I was like, the first diet that I actually remember going on, I have journals of keeping track of my food when I was 12, right? 
But I remember consciously going on a diet when I was like 16 or 17 because someone, a boy at school made a joke about me gaining weight. And I was like, oh, that's the thing I can't be, right? I can't be big. I have to be smaller. Um, and then I think, you know, I went through this whole yo-yo dieting for years of my life. And, you know, then I finally got to the point where I recognized no matter how thin I get, I still wasn't happy. And I was like, oh, the weight isn't the problem, right? And that's where I really started to to reimagine what and re not reimagine, reconfigure what the word fat means, right? And then I was like, oh, fat is a descriptor of a body size, just like skinny is a descriptor of a body size. And how old were you at this point? Because that's that's like a huge leap. No, no, no. I was like, I yes, but I was like in my I was in my twenties at this point. Okay, wow. Probably like I'm 37 now. So probably like my getting close to my late 20s. Wow. Amazing. And I was like, oh, that's just the descriptor, descriptive body, right? Like some bodies are skinny, some bodies are fat. And then it was also like, that's no different than being like, oh, I have black hair and you have brown hair. It's like literally just a descriptor of your body. And I was like, oh, and then I also started thinking, but there's so many connotations that are attached to that word though, right? That give that word so much meaning to us. And um, and then I read Sonia Renee Taylor's book, The Body is Not Apology, so right? Good. Yeah. And I was like, oh, 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 I'm starting to make all these connections, right? And I read Fearing the Black Body. And I was like, oh, 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 you know? Yes. And and so I think there's so much tied up into that word fat, right? And, and there's historical reasons that there's tied into that, right? And going back to like white supremacy and, and racism. And so there's all these things, but at, at its core and its essence of where the word is a descriptor of the way a body shows up in the world. And I was like, oh yeah. And also like bodies change and they're going to be in all these different shapes and sizes. Right. And also none of us were, uh, we're like, it's so easy for us again to look around and be like, oh, some of us have blue eyes some of us have brown eyes like yeah genetics but then we get to bodies and we're like oh no no they're all supposed to be thin though and it's like no of course they're not all supposed to be thin right yeah yeah and then when did you take that kind of you were taking your first liberatory steps you were you know unlearning what you'd been taught when did that start to become your like mission in life was this because i also read that you studied social justice in college is that where those ideas were first presented? Because I'm always amazed at like, how do people first have that thought of, oh, hang on, what if I uncouple? Like that uncoupling is, it's amazing to me that we do it at all, quite frankly. Literally, especially in the society we exist in. The fact that we're ever able to uncouple is in itself a miracle. And so it's really interesting because, you know, this, I, I went to school for social justice and sociology, as you just said. And so I've always been in this mindset of like, I've always approached the world with a social justice lens. And again, I just think that even came from, I remember my first um, sociology class I took was in high school and I started reading these books and I was just so engrossed in like things like the cycles of poverty and like, you know, social determinants of health. And I was like, oh, there's all of these, there are all these systems in place, right? That are having an impact on how we all experience the world, and especially being a black woman. And like, I didn't come from like a low income neighborhood, so to speak, but like I saw it all around me and I'm like, oh, this is, these are the systems in place. This is why these things exist, right? These are why housing projects exist. And so I'm having all of those. And so that was like really always at the core of my belief system, but I never really made that connection to bodies, right? For a very long time. And that didn't show up in your work, in your studies, did it? No fat liberation, even though you're studying social justice, right? Never, never showed up, never showed up and never made that connection to body. And so it was really when I was trying to like heal my own relationship with body image because I was struggling so much and really like, okay, recognizing again, like I've been told that fat loss is the thing that's going to make me happy, right? Like on the other side of fat loss is all the beautiful things. You're finding the dream, partner of your dreams, the job of your yeah. dreams. <laughs> You'll look in the mirror and be happy every day. And then I got to the quote unquote other side and I was like, I am actually more miserable than I was yes. before. Ugh. And so that's when I was like, okay, so the issue is not me. There's the issue with something else. And again, I go back to reading Sonia's book because when I read that book, my social justice mind, my sociology mind, and my social welfare mind was like, oh, duh, like here's, that's the connection, right? That's the piece that I wasn't thinking about or talking, I didn't have the knowledge of. And then it became so clear that of course it's a social justice issue. Yeah. I have goosebumps. Like you've said, you when when you describe that, I have total goosebumps over my body because it's like, 
And at the same time, as always, I am completely outraged. That will surprise nobody listening because I'm outraged a lot that even in social justice studies, same with like mo most modern DEI programs now still don't talk about body and anti-fatness. Um, so I'm outraged about that. But I have goosebumps for the fact of that moment of like, oh, that connection, putting it together for yourself to honor your own belief that you deserve to have happiness in exactly the body you are like talk about a radical idea i mean and that's the thing right it, and like the thing is it is radical within this it shouldn't be radical it but shouldn't it be <laughs> yeah. that we exist in right and it's like oh yeah like what a radical idea that i should wholeheartedly love myself right, right. and i always talk about like you know there's so many different spots on your journey to liberation right and i know a lot of i'm not opposed to body neutrality at all but one thing i think of when i say the word acceptance it's like oh i'm just gonna it's i'm gonna acquiesce right and like yeah we get to, sometimes we do acquiesce on the way to, to liberation but i was like what a radical idea for a black woman to unabashedly love herself that is a that is radical in the society like right so like I deserve that, but also not only do I deserve that, all of us deserve that. And so me doing that work is also an example that other people, we can, because we all deserve that. A hundred percent. Yeah. And then, so this led to you starting to do this work in the world, which then of course led to the book. So what was the, what, what was the work you were doing that led to the book? So, um, on my quest, you know, on the way to just like driving to be in a smaller body, I became a personal trainer and, and that journey was also because um, I started powerlifting and powerlifting, I will say, was like the first step in me thinking like, oh, I think my body is more than just decoration in the world. Oh, Because I got like, I grew up, you know, not doing a lot of athletic things. I had a reputation in my family as being the weakling, which didn't bother me. I was like, yeah, I'm weak. I don't care. Like, whatever. <laughs> and I was like, some people are strong. Some people are weak. I'm weak. And then I started strength training and there were a whole bunch of like a uh, series of events. I initially joined the gym to like make me skinny and then i came to this powerlifting gym um the strength and conditioning gym and i saw women like deadlifting and bench pressing and squatting and i was like oh that looks pretty cool and i just watched for a long time and then for some reason the owner was like i think you should try this and i'm like mm, okay because i had been really curious probably because i was like you know watching with my mouth open, like every time i was in the gym right and I so cliche, but I always say it was like love at first lift. As soon as my hands were on the barbell, I was just like, wow, this feels so empowering. And so through that process, I ended up getting really strong. I started competing in powerlifting. I was like deadlifting over 400 pounds, like squatting over 300 pounds. So what's a deadlift just for people who don't know? Like 400 pounds deadlift. So deadlift is a movement, a barbell movement where you are like picking weight up off the ground with, you know, so it's just like me bending over, picking up. 400 pounds into the ground <laughs> and then putting it back down. Unreal. Yeah. Wow. So I got really strong and that was so empowering. And I felt like I was like, oh, I thought that I was a weak person and that just wasn't true. Right. Like, and so I was like, oh, what other narratives do I hold that aren't actually true? Mm -hmm. However, at the time, I was still entrenched in diet culture. I was still counting every single mat mar morsel of food that I was doing all the things. Right. And I was in the leanest body had ever been as adult, the strongest body had ever been as adult. And I was just as miserable as I'd ever been. Right. So that wasn't the answer. <laughs> However, I still really love powerlifting. It's an important part of my journey. But through that process, what I understood was I was like, oh, wow, strength training is really empowering. Being like physically strong is also really empowering. And so I started, I became a coach and a trainer. And so I started training other clients and I was working full time in like a corporate setting. And then I was training on the side. And so I was really in fitness, really. And when I was in fitness space um, or started like doing fitness on the side, I was like, oh, this would be really cool to do this full time at some point. Um, and then I was like popping around on the internet as you know one does. And I ran across this coach who was doing like business coaching, didn't even like really do much research. And she was like, oh, I can help you like learn how to start an internet based business. And I was like, that's exactly what I want. So I like gave her $6,000 without any research. I know. Ooh. But it ended up being great. It all worked oh, out. So but good. So good. Because sometimes they're not. It just went really wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it went really wrong, but it went really well. Um, and one of the things, her name was Jill Coleman. And one of the things Jill taught me or like encouraged was that we should all have a blog. And so I had a love of writing when I was a child. I was like, spent all of my free time going to the library to get books and like writing stories. That's like the thing I wanted to do. And then I like got older and I was like, that doesn't make sense. I can't do that for a living. And I forgot about writing. 
And so Jill encouraged all of us to start blogging and I started blogging again. And the other thing that happened is when I got into the fitness industry and I like really wanted to take it seriously. And so I started going to conferences and events and then I would get there and I'm like, oh, everyone here looks the same. Which was? Thin, white, cis, mostly men, every presentation, all the, all the speakers were primarily men. If there were women, they were like thin white women, but it, it was no diversity. And I was like, oh, this doesn't feel good. And I remember like I was trying to create graphics for something and I Googled like women doing push-ups, and everything that showed up were like thin white women doing push-ups. And I was like, oh, these are the only people that work out. And then I was like, and so again, me having all these conversations offline about racism, about feminism, about all of these things, but not wanting to merge it with my online fitness personality because I'm like, again, this was like 2016, 2017. We weren't really having conversations about these things. Um, and so I felt really like, this doesn't feel good. This feels just congruent. And so I wrote an article entitled is fitness only for thin white women. And then I proceeded to not do anything with it for like months because I was scared. <laughs> so that's a scary article to write. I mean, talk about courage. Well, and the, the funny thing in hindsight is that at the time I also had like no one reading anything out. And I, I had like maybe 400 followers on Instagram. So it wasn't like I had some huge audience, but it still felt really scary. And so I remember my business coach, Jill, at the time, she's like, hey, whatever happened with that article? And I was like, oh, I kind of like chickened out. And she essentially was like, listen, you can, you can, you know, do the scary things or you, or you can be a voice of change within the industry or you can choose not to, like it, the choice is yours. I was like, all right, whatever. And so it was the day I had, to, I was still working in my job at the time. So the day I had to travel for work. So I was like, I'm going to post this article and I won't be able to be on the internet. It's going to run away. So I did, I posted the article, I came back to internet like three or four hours later and the unthinkable had happened. People had actually read it and it was like, getting shared all over the internet. And I was also getting like messages from other like black and brown women primarily saying like, oh my gosh, thank you for saying this thing. I have been feeling this way for so long and didn't know how to put words to it. And I think that, that I feel like for me was like a pivotal moment because that's when I realized like showing up as who I really am authentically is so much more important than the fear. And you're showing up for others. And I'm showing up for others, right? And I really felt the power in that. And that really is when I felt empowered to like keep talking and pushing the conversation that wasn't being had yet. Um, and eventually all these breadcrumbs led me to where I am now. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you to Coach Jill. <laughs> that was $6,000 well spent. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and yeah, and then so all that has led to, I want to read the full title of your book because I think it is so brilliant. All right. So your book is called The Body Liberation Project. And the subtitle is How Understanding Racism and Diet Culture Helps Cultivate Joy and Build Collective Freedom. Those are some very bold claims, Chrissy, and I love it. <laughs> Tell me about that title. Why was it so important? So I'm a creative writing coach on the side also. And so I know so much goes into a title. So I imagine there was a lot of thought put into the length of this title that all these words are in it. Liberation, racism, diet culture, joy, collective freedom. Like that's a wordy title. What was important about this title for you? Um, yeah, it is a wordy, it is a wordy title. And we're using bold words in that title too, right? <laughs> like really going there. I, I think what was important for me is I didn't want to mask the book behind the lens of anything than what we're actually talking about. We're talking about racism, right? And like, yes, that makes people uncomfortable sometimes, but like also we need to have uncomfortable conversations. And so like being really clear that we're going to be talking about racism in this book felt really necessary to me. Um, and then, you know, I talked so much about liberation and freedom, um, and the importance of that, and especially the importance of collective liberation. Um, because the words of so many people, Fannie Lou Hamer or Audre Lorde and so many other what people have said the same thing in different words. Basically, none of us are free unless all of us are free. And so the work is like, yes, we want to find individual liberation and freedom in our bodies, but also we want to dismantle and divest from the systems that are making it difficult for all of us to do that. And the recognition and understanding that when the most marginalized among us are free, we're all free. And like, that is the end goal, right? Because yes, it's one thing to have personal liberation. But we want to create a society and a future for future generations that we are all free to exist in our bodies, free of harm. Yeah. I mean, we have to at this point. Like, I, I feel 
low probability of success for our human race right now. <laughs> so it's again, when, and again, anyone listening knows this, but it's one of the reasons I started this podcast because I was like, there has to be, I want to highlight not only for myself, but for everyone, like that there are amazing people out there in fat bodies doing the work of liberation for every body, for all of us, collective liberation, collective freedom. How does it get personal for you? Like, I, we understand what it means, but how is it personal for you? So no one's asking this, this is a great question. Um, I think it's, per I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but the first thing that came to my mind when you just said that is like, I think when I think of the work I'm doing and I think of the importance of it, one thing I'm always thinking about is my ancestors, right? I've been, I'm descended of um, enslaved people and freedom is what they dreamed about, right? And I'm the manifestation of that freedom. And so going on the manifestation of that freedom and also it's like, how am I then also helping to set others free? Yes, we have, you know, we're, we're not enslaved anymore, but all of us are still in so many ways not able to live fully liberated lives. And so for me, this work is also just an extension of my ancestors and the ability to continue sharing liberation in ways that I can. And I think it obviously looks different than, than that, what my ancestors were doing. But, you know, the quote that says, you know, I met my ancestors' wildest dreams. I often think about that and I say, actually, like, I'm bigger than my ancestors' wildest dreams because I don't think that they even saw what I'm doing for themselves, right? And so it's like, this is soul work. This is ancestor work. This is me um, being a good ancestor in the words of Leila Saad. Yeah. Yeah. And I always think about legacy too. Like, you know, in, in the work of you being a good ancestor, you're shifting legacies of generations. Yeah. Shifting legacy, like healing intergenerational trauma, right? And I just, like every good thing, and I just, I so believe that when, you know, we put work out into the world, we get paid back for it in ways that we don't even know how. So like, we don't know how it's going to come back to us, but every good thing that happens to me, I'm like, oh, this is, this is, this is from my ancestors, right? I'm, I'm living in, in, I'm embodying what they wanted for themselves that they didn't have access to. And so I never feel bad for the good things that happen to me. I'm like, my ancestors are so proud. They're so happy. They're so grateful. Amazing. What are some of those good things that have happened as a result of this work? I mean, honestly, um, I'm never, there's never a moment I'm not in awe. <laughs> honestly, I just, so true. There's just never a moment. I remember um, when the book, you know, this is like a, a minor thing. I shouldn't say it's minor. It's not a minor thing, but it wasn't a monetary thing. It was like a surprise bonus thing. The day the book came out, Amazon, was, it was Women's History Month and Amazon chose my book out of one of five books they chose. And it was like on a billboard at NYC. And I was like, like I could, younger me could have never dream, dreamt of this moment, right? Like younger me would have never thought that was reality for me. Um, you know, my father passed away in 2019 unexpectedly. And my dad, I don't know why, intuitive, I guess, in his own way, he used to always tell people, but this is when I was still working at my job. And I used to be like, dad, why are you telling people this? He used to tell people, oh, that's my, that's my famous daughter. That's my daughter. She's just doing all these incredible things in the world. And I was like, literally just working at my job. And I was like, my dad is just lying to people. It's <laughs> literally just lying to people. But I got to, I got to be on the Chairman Hall show when the book came out. And I was like, oh, dad, this is for you, right? This is for you. And so, and I just think like, you know, the, the, as a result of the work that I've gotten to do, like I, I quit my corporate job in 2018, I've been able to like sustain myself writing and doing creative work, which is such a gift. Right. And I just think that in itself, I'm like, oh, wow, what does it mean to be? And I think of the work of Trisha Hershey and uh, Rest is Resistance. And I'm like, what does it mean to be a black woman who gets to be free in the world and choose what they do every day, choose their own adventure? And like, for me, I'm like, wow, that is a power that that is just so powerful. And again, that goes back. My ancestors could never have dreamt of the life that I'm living. Not that I'm like a multimillionaire and whatever. I'm not. Trust me, I'm not. But that I have freedom and I have choice. Like they could never have fathomed that for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that you brought in Rest is Resistance with Trisha Hersey. I'll link to it in the notes. I think I've linked to it a number of times because I find every time I listen to her speak, you feel the power of that. The fact that she's like, 
hey, I'm not going to answer your emails. I'm like, what? Like, she's resting. You get to do that? Like, because it's so permission giving to others. And I think that's what's so powerful about what you're speaking is like, when you modeling it, it forces, even if people aren't really wanting to be uncoupled, it kind of is like, oh, hang on, she can do that? Yes. And Trisha put up a post last week, and again, this is very poorly paraphrased, but it was something about like, there is no model for what it looks to be a free Black woman in the world. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. There is no model for that, right? And so we are creating the model. And like, even like, you know, following Trisha's work and her journey, it's so powerful, right? To see someone show up and say, no, I'm not going to do this thing. Oh, I'm going to choose rest, right? Like capitalism cannot have me. Yes. Like that's powerful. Yeah. And like, she said it out loud. (laughs) I was like, that's amazing. Like in big, in like, you know, some of the podcasts I've listened to her be on are huge, have huge reach. And she's like, no, which really, I, this is where I'm very excited to to go with you today is this idea of how for some people that is deeply, deeply fucking threatening. Like how dare you take up space with your body and your voice and your mind? Like who the hell do you think you are? Like I am, I, I'm just going to guess, but it's probably true that you received pushback (laughs) would be a nice term for it. Uh, you're, uh, (laughs) But like, this is a really threatening thing because of the systems of oppression that have been put in place to keep black people, brown people, BIPOC, like indigenous, like, and women, you know, basically anyone who's not a white dude, you know, we're not supposed to do these things. So how has that shown up for you? This idea, like, that you are threatening the quote unquote establishment, which good on you. But like, how does that, how have you noticed that showing up? I mean, I will say that first article, that's why I was so scared to push publish on that, even though I didn't have a lot of people following me, right? Because it was like, who are you? And I think also because I didn't have a lot of people following because I didn't, you know, I, no one quote unquote knew who I was. They're like, who is, who is, who are you? to decide you're going to call out the fitness industry or call out racism or call out anything. Like, who are you to speak truth to power? Um, And it's really, really scary. I think, again, for anybody who is not a straight white man, it's it's like you need to like stay in your place almost, right? And to say that, yes, I've gotten lots lots of negative feedback, right? Um, Very harmful comments, like, almost every time I write something that someone doesn't like, people email me very negative things, right? All kinds of names, like racist, like every everything, all the worst things you can imagine that have happened. And at first that was really challenging for me because um, I, I wasn't used to that, right? And I wasn't, I uh, didn't really know how to handle it. And then I got to the point where I just like, I don't give a F anymore. And I think one of the things that really helped me with that actually was that I was at a book event for, Love Yeshu, um, and I may be misquoting, I might be saying her last name wrong, so forgive me if I am, but she wrote lots of books. Her most recent book is like How to Trouble Troublemaker. Am I quoting that book wrong? I'll have to look it up, but I, but I know who you're referring to. I'm going to link to it. So I was at one of Lovey's events and someone was talking to her about this or asking her a question that was very much like, how do you deal with negative feedback? And just like a certain point, I stopped looking and I stopped listening because I recognize that if I want to create change in the world, there's always going to be people who don't want me to do that. And that's just the reality of the situation. And if I'm going to be a change maker, I'm going to face people who have a problem with it and who are going to have negative things to say. And I'm just going to choose to ignore them because, because the reality is if I wasn't saying anything that disrupted the status quo, there would be no naysayers. I was like, oh, yes, of course, right? Anytime you're talking truth to power, you're talking about dismantling systems that benefit people, there have to be naysayers. There have to be people that want to maintain the status quo. And so when I heard that, I was like, oh, I just need to care less. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't still bother me sometimes. Of course it does, but I've gotten so much better at it. And I also think that, again, going back to this idea of like, you know, the audacity of you as a Black woman to decide to take up space in the world, right? To decide to speak truth to power, to decide that you're going to talk about this thing. Like, who do you think you are? And it's like, no, who am I not to do that thing? Um, And again, I think that 
when any of us do the courageous thing, we are modeling for other folks that they can do courageous things too. And and sometimes there are folks who don't have, and that's the other thing too, right? Like I always talk about the fact that you can be privileged and oppressed at the same time, right? And that's why we talk about intersectionality. And so for those of us who have more privilege in the world, and it's not that we use our privilege for whatever, because really the goal is that we're dismantling the systems that allow for privilege to exist in the first place. But for those of us who have less intersecting identities, I feel like it's my responsibility to show up in those spaces that I have the bandwidth and the emotional capacity and that I feel like I feel and I feel safe to speak truth to power. That's my work in the world. Um, and so like, why should I not be doing that? And also it models for folks who think that folks like us should not be doing that. But I guess I should be doing this actually. And, um, we all have to be challenged. I think it's just the work of challenging the status quo. Um, and Audre Lorde has another quote that's, and again, I'm really paraphrasing these things, but when I like use my, my purpose and strength and my vision, it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid or not. And that listen, continue to be like my guiding light, right? Like, yes, I might be afraid, but also I'm doing this in, in purpose of something far bigger than myself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I hadn't heard that quote before. It's so true. Do you feel on purpose with this work? I do. I do. I feel very on purpose with this work. I feel um, like this is what I'm, yes, I feel like I was put, and it's such a big thing to say, you know, I used to even be scared to say that because like, again, who do you think you are to have the audacity to say that? But I'm like, no, I have the audacity to say it. Yeah. <laughs> You're dismantling, well, and right there, imposter syndrome is a construction of white supremacy to keep us from having the audacity, right? So you're saying hell no to that. <laughs> hell no to that, right? And it's like, no, I really do feel like this work that I'm doing is part of my mission here in this lifetime. It is what I was supposed to do in this lifetime. And I don't think it's, not, there's so much more than I'm supposed to do, but I feel wholeheartedly that this was what I was supposed to do at this time and for a very specific purpose. I have to ask a very coachy question because I'm just so intrigued because it's pretty rare to have people say that and truly feel it fully in a very embodied way. Because even as you're saying it, I'm feeling it in my body. So how does this show up in your body for you? Like you live this in a very embodied way, I can tell. Like what is that? Because again, we're talking about bodies, right? So like, how does that run through you fully? Honestly, every time I, and I don't say that out loud a lot, but I have said it out loud. It's probably the first time I said it on a podcast though. And like, I literally have goosebumps in my body when I say that because I feel it at such a like visceral level. Uh, and you know, the thing about this book coming to life is that I probably like four, three or four years ago, I was like, I'm going to write a book someday, but like someday meant like, you know, five, 10 years in the future. And the way this book came to fruition was like, no, the universe, like, no, you're writing the book now. Like, and I always tell people, I did not have, it's, this is how I know this is my work in the world because I did not have to go at, it's like the most incredible story. And I don't take it lightly, but I did not have to go out in the world and say, Hey, I want to write a book. How am I going to do it? Literally, it, it, it came to me and every step of the way I got a call. I was on a, I, I wrote an article for Shape Magazine that was, to me, not a big deal, but went viral. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then the Today Show said, can you come talk about this article? I'm like, sure, I'll do that. And then a publisher emailed me after seeing him in the show and said, do you want to write a book? I'm like, yeah, one day. We had a 30-minute call and the person was like, okay, I'm going to pitch this to the sales team. And I'm like, I don't think that's how this works, but okay. I call a person that I, I, I reached out to a person I knew mutually through social media, had met one time in person. And I said, hey, can I pay you for a call? Because I know you've published. I have like a couple of questions. I get on the phone with that person. She's like, that's amazing. You need an agent. I'm like, I don't know how to get an agent. She's like, well, I know someone. I'll ask them. They want to talk to you. The next day, the person emails me and says, let's talk. And they're like, I love to represent you. And I'm like, this does not happen this way. And so we sign a contract. The publisher comes back with an offer. And I, my, my agent, who I literally met, you know, 48 hours before, like, I know you don't know me, but like my advice is that this is an okay deal, but you don't even have a book proposal. Like, I think if you write a book proposal, you could get a better deal. So I said, okay, I trust you. Turn down the book deal. And then she's like, write a proposal. And then she introduced me to someone to write the proposal. And I have to end up paying this person for the proposal. And I'm like, wow, this is really not the way I thought this was going to go, but cool. We write a proposal, takes me four months. Then, you know, she, we shop the book around. 
I get five offers from major publishers. The offer I end up taking is five times the offer that I originally got from the other publisher. And so when I tell people this book came, to, it was like, the, they were like, no, the time is now. And that's why I feel so viscerally about what I'm saying. Cause like, I know literally they were like, no, you're doing this now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. That for every writer listening, <laughs> that is an incredible, incredible story. Cause you're right. That is not how it happens. It's like, it was like domino after domino after domino all for the purpose. Did you doubt ever? No. And so that's the thing too, that it was like, when I first turned that first publishing deal down in hindsight, it's like, I, like who says no to money when they have no idea what's really in the future with a person at the advice of a person they literally just met 48 hours ago. But in that moment, I had so much peace. I never even thought twice about it. I was like, okay, I trust you. The answer is no. And I felt so much peace in my spirit that I was like, it wasn't, I never second guessed it. And then again, she introduced me to this person to work with the book proposal, which was the best choice I ever made. But also I had to pay this person $10,000. So I'm like, I just said no to this money and now I'm paying. And none of this, like if you, if I thought about it for too long, it wouldn't have made any sense, right? Because I'd be like, this sounds nonsensical. But I just had so much peace every step of the way that I knew it was ordained. Yeah. Yeah. The word coming up for me as this whole story is the word surrender, which is like where we get out of our own way and we just allow whatever universe, God, spirit, ancestors, whatever it is to like, yeah, just like work through us and not fight it and trust. Oh, that's such a hard thing to do. But, but when we can do that and, and even for me, like I did all of that and there's still times where I'm like, I forget, right? I'm like, okay, go back to that place of surrender. But when we can get to that place truly of surrender, for me anyways, I find that's where the most beautiful things occur for me. Yeah. Woo. I feel, <laughs> I don't know if you feel this way, but as someone who is very much a doer and like set goals and da da da, like surrender, it literally, even when I first heard the word probably in 2010, because when I was doing my some learning, some like adult education learning. And then again, it came back in 2014 when I was doing my coach training. This word elicits such a strong visceral reaction for me. Like I hate it, but I also know at the same time, it's like what I'm here to learn. Yeah. It's so hard though, right? Because again, we're, we live in a capitalist society where conditions you do produce, produce, produce. And that when things aren't working, you just got to work harder, right? So this idea of surrender is like antithetical to everything that surrounds us and to everything that we're taught. And like, I, for myself, find that like, you know, when I'm spending too much time on the internet or Instagram or TikTok, all these places, and I'm listening to other people, like, sometimes I have to quiet the noise because I will go into that mode of like goals. What do I need to do? How am I going to accomplish this? What do I need to do to make this happen? And then I always have to remind myself, listen, you, if you had have went into that mode before things would you, you it wouldn't have unfolded the way it did right but even having that experience i still have to remind myself of that all the time yeah to trust yeah. the unfolding trust the unfolding yeah that's so that's beautiful yeah yeah oh i love that chrissy it's so inspiring and it is our world makes it so hard i literally work on this every day i think about it constantly i have like a rock in front of me that says surrender on it because it's it is we it again talk about uncoupling like that that work when we it it, it is just so oppositional and so i'm so grateful you shared your story of like how like what happened when you did that, it just, it really fell into place so beautifully for you. And here you are doing this incredible work. Thank you for allowing me to share that. And I think too, for me, like, again, I'm always going back to my experience as a black woman. I think it's so important also to share that story because it's like, for a lot of us, we don't, we don't necessarily feel like we're deserving all the time or worthy of these things or that things can be easy for folks that look like us when folks look like us can be black or brown bodies or fat bodies or you know any of the marginalized identities right sometimes we don't feel like we are deserving of ease or that things can come to us easy again and not for our own it's not our own fault that we feel that way it's because we are also oftentimes constantly struggling to exist in a society where we do feel like we have to fight the basic or the bare minimum right and so i think that reminder that yes it can also happen for folks like us as well yeah. Oh, it's really hitting me when you said that around like we get accustomed and almost expect the struggle, which is kind of like we fall in love with our own prison. 
yeah, we, we get addicted to the feeling of suffering. And again, it's not our fault though, because for we, because the world has shown us that in so many ways, but then we get used to only that feeling of struggle or only that feeling of suffering. So it's hard to trust the ease. Yes. It's hard to trust ease or it's hard to trust like ease is for other folks, not for folks like us. I mean, I'm just going to say, talk about a mind fuck because it's like you get used to one thing. It's hard to trust ease. I think this is leading into where we're going to go around this idea of like what's on the other side of liberation. Like how do we begin to trust ease? Like what's been your experience of that? Oh my gosh. Um, it is so hard to trust ease, to trust my body again, all of those things. I feel like they're so intertwined, right? Um, and it is really, truly a journey for all of those things. Because again, I always like in like diet culture is the opposite of trust, right? It's like all of the rules, do this thing, eat this thing, exercise this way. And on the other side is like, oh no, I trust myself that I know what's best for me. It's, and, and that's where freedom and liberation lay on that side, right? And in diet culture, lie the rules and the regimentation. And so even the process of like trusting ease for myself, it came in like in, incremental things, right? So for example, like even, even writing that article and then I'm realizing like, oh, I did this thing that felt really hard and it was still okay. I was like, oh, okay, I did the hard thing and I survived that hard thing, right? And so that felt a little confidence that like, oh, I can maybe do another harder thing, right? And 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 then I can trust that no matter what happens, I can figure it out. And I think these things are so intertwined because I also know that when I like really came to a place of self-trust and I moved with my body, right? And moving towards liberation, then I also was like, oh, so the thing is that using my body to try to shrink it and obsess about it was also like the low hanging fruit because there were these bigger things that I really needed to deal with, but my body felt like the thing I could control. And that felt like the thing that I could put my energy into. And so when I was like, oh, no, nah, I'm not using my body that way anymore. Then I was like, oh, I have to actually deal with all the other things that are happening. And that meant making some really hard decisions, right? And I was like, okay, like, for example, leaving a long-term relationship, right? I, I was married for 11 years. And then, like, leaving that relationship was very, very hard, was not what people in my life wanted me to do. I also knew it was the right thing for both of us. And I had to think back and, like, okay, I've done other hard things, and I've survived those hard things, right? And on the other side of those hard things, there was joy, there was ease, there was... Even though I couldn't see it then, it was there. And so on the other side of this hard decision... Even though in the middle, it looks really muddy and really, really challenging. I know that on the other side of that will be joy. It will be ease. Eventually, I'll get there. And so it was just like decision after decision that I knew was in service of my highest good. And just, again, trusting that no matter what happens, I know that I can, I can survive this thing. And then eventually, I will thrive, right? And so I think that's always the process for me. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I love the the two tick. I mean, they're they're techniques. Like I talk to my clients around in terms of techniques, which is taking baby steps, like doing the small thing, and then there's almost the hard. The other one, like you said, when you're in the middle of it, it's really hard because you're almost like trusting past self in service of future self, even though you can't see it. That is exactly it. Yeah, yeah, and that's. <sighs> That's like you're blindfolded and you're like, all right, I'm going to trust where we're going. I don't know. But I know that my future self, this is the right thing for my future self. And it's so, and it's so true. But again, it's like, that's the really hard. And that's the hard thing though. It's like, because you can't see where future you exist, right? You can't see what future you feels like. You can't feel the joy and pleasure that future you has. But what you can feel right now is like maybe the pain that you're feeling or the heartache you're experiencing and you're like, is there really any joy for my future self? Or is this where I is this where it ends right here? Yeah. And that and I mean, and then we come back to surrender because are we supposed to I mean, I think about this all the time. We're gonna get really spiritual because like like are we supposed to know? You know, if we're trusting that we're being led somewhere, a lot of the learning I've done has said, you know, well then stop getting in the way. Don't try to choose where you're going because you don't know. And in fact, what's coming for you is even bigger than you could possibly dream or imagine. So why are you trying so hard 
Sophia, <laughs> to like determine, right? Chrissy, to determine where it goes. And it's like, oh my God, it's so, it's hard to hold both. I think this is like, again, another challenge. Yes. And you're right. It's so hard to hold both. And that's like also, yes, now we're getting really woo and spiritual, but I love it here. Um, so oftentimes for me, even now, it's like when I'm thinking about dreaming about the possibility and dreaming about what the next iteration of myself looks like, I'm always like, this or something better. Yes, me too. I say that too. Oh, I love it because of, I can't even fathom how good it could get, right? I couldn't even fathom what the possibilities really are. So it's like, this is what I'm asking for, but give me something better too, because you know, you being universe, source, ancestors, whatever, you know so much better than I do what the what I really desire or what I re- what this ne- next iteration of me could look like. Yeah. And I don't want to like pre-restrict what's possible, which is what I do, which I think is what a lot of us do, right? A lot of us do it, right? And if we just bring it back to the established systems of oppression, they want us to do that. They want us in picket fence life, partnered up, work in a job where we have no freedom because we only work to pay our mortgage. Therefore, we can't raise hell when they grab more and more power. And like, it's so designed. Yes. And this totally ties back to the body too, right? Because when we are spending all of our energy and all of our attention to the work of like shrinking our body or keeping it smaller or maintaining it, we don't have any energy left over to even think about. With. God, there's nothing left. When I was deep in diet culture, there is nothing, nothing left. left. Yeah. There's nothing left. Right. So it's like, it's a tool of white supremacy and the patriarchy to keep us distracted with this pursuit of thinness. Right. In pursuit of like Eurocentric standards of beauty, because then we can't think about anything else. And, and then it maintains the status quo because none of us have any energy to, to disrupt the systems. Yeah. So every person who says, no, I will disrupt of course, there's going to be threats. Of course, that's going to be viewed as threatening. Of course, we're going to get trolls and nasty stuff to keep to keep us scared and small. And what we're saying is, um, hell no to that. Hell no to that. We won't. We're not going to stay small. We're going to take up all the space we want. And I just like I love what you just said about like you know, like white picket lies, where we just like do the thing that we are told we're supposed to do. And I keep going back to this idea of like, when I divested from diet culture, that's when I started thinking about the fact that I didn't want to white picket picket life after all. That's when I was like, oh, actually, I never took the time to think about what I really desire for myself. And even that's scary because you're like, oh, now I have to uh, uproot all of these things. But also that's, that's, I'm creating for myself the life I really desire. And I never took the time to even think about it. Right. Yeah. And... (sighs) And it's interesting, I see little bits of this with people choosing like tiny house living. I mean, it's a very practical example, but like tiny house living and van life and being nomads, people choosing not to have children, people choosing not to get married or to have very differently structured partnerships like polyamory and all sorts of other ways of being. Like it, it is in opposition because people are attuning to what they want. Because the hard thing is, even as we make all these decisions, we still live within a system run by capitalism. Like I can't buy groceries with dandelions from my lawn, unfortunately. <laughs> Although I can eat those dandelions. My grandmother would say, pick them and eat them. And then you're in this position where you're both trying to hold space to choose for yourself, to truly attune full body desire while the struggle gets even harder because now you are conscious and actively rebelling (laughs) against the systems and it's a lot to hold. And so that's why like, I don't take lightly at ever how incredible it is the work that the people I talk to are doing because that it's a, that's a lot to hold. It's so, it'd be so much easier to just not see. It would be so much easier, right? I mean, you mentioned being child free. So I'm, I'm child free by choice. And that really triggered a lot of people when I told people, oh, I'm decided I'm never having kids. Like, if you want to ruffle some feathers, tell people that you don't want to have children. Right. Uh, that's one that it's funny because I'm also, ch- well, I'm, I am child free by choice, but then I got married to a man who has stepchildren. So I'm now a stepmom. I guess that means I now have children, but it's a very, anyway, it's a very weird thing. Step parenthood is a, a whole thing, but I've now started following 
people who are child free by choice talking about it. I had no idea there was such vehement hatred for people saying, and I'm like, what business is, is it of anybody's? Why do people care so much? And again, I think it's a symbol of, I am not opting in because when we have kids that ties us to the system because we need to provide shelter. We can't just go do whatever we want. We are now obligated and we're creating little workers to continue the cycle. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, there's just something so upsetting to people about you deciding you're not gonna participate in that system, which I was honestly at first really shocked too, because I'm like, why would people care? <laughs> like, why would that bother you? And I think there's so many things. I think anytime you're choosing to like opt out of whatever conditioning, the social conditioning, that bot that triggers people. I think there's a, a group of people that in some way, whether they acknowledge it or not, perhaps feel like they never made that choice for themselves or thought about it for themselves. And so that maybe can bothers them. And I think there's another subset of people who feel like it's selfish. I don't know. I, I just think it's so interesting though, how much vitriol and hate you will get if you say you do not want to have children from, from all the genders. Like it's not specific to anyone. Like one has a very strong feeling for it. They do. Well, I mean, it's baked into our medical system. So I have endometriosis. So I'm on all these endometriosis boards and a lot of people have to get hysterectomies to help alleviate some of the symptoms. They have to go in and, you know, do excisions and all kinds of things with the reproductive system area. And people like doctors refuse. They say no. It's like someone, I have a friend who's in her forties and the doctor's like, no, you might change your mind about children. She's like, that is not your decision for me. I am telling you. What I want to do with my body. With my body. And it's, yeah, it's just, it gets really wacky what people and what's been baked in in terms of the fact that doctors think they can say that. I mean, well, I mean, we won't even go into what's happening in the U.S. right now with like abortion. Oh, my God. There's so many things, Chrissy. But once you see how it's all designed to keep us within established systems, it's like you can't unsee it. So what makes liberation so great then? Like what happens on the other side? Because it's we're t I mean, we're talking about all these negative things that happen, but there's so much beauty and brilliance and incredible things that happen too. So share us, share with us a bit about that. Um, I think on the other side, there's just so much joy and so much pleasure. And I just, I really feel like, honestly, when I talk about liberation, I'm like, there's not a single part of an, another single aspect of my life that hasn't been transformed because of coming to a place of body liberation, right? From things as simple as like, just like walking, like, there's just something freeing about not caring what anybody thinks about your body, right? Like I'm just going to leave the house and I don't care what anybody thinks about my body. Like I could not care less what anyone thinks, right? From being able to like go and experience my life with friends and not be worrying about what I'm eating. And like, you know, be, I love food. Like I'm such a foodie, right? And to just like have so much pleasure in the experience of eating again is like I... I just... How much of that I lost. And it's just like, wow, eating and like like food is community, right? Food is experience. Food is how we share our love. And I was recently reading an article in the cut about Ozempic and like some of the people were like, oh my gosh, it's so great. I don't even think about food anymore. And I'm like, that's such a tragedy, right? Like food is what makes this part of our humanity. It's like what makes us who we are. And it's like so much pleasure in that. And then just like pleasure in um, like, like vacationing and going on trips and like not always just not spending any of my mental energy thinking about what my body looks like and just being like, wow, I'm, I'm able to really experience the life and be present and to like, you know, take all the pictures and not trying to hide myself or hide my body and create memories. Um, I talk in this book about like, I got an opportunity to go snowboarding last year and only would have never wanted to do that. Cause I'm going to be in a group of strength, not even strangers. I mean, yes, they were strangers, but then there were also like, people that in my mind were way cooler than me. Like they were like NFL players there. Like all these, like, like very cool people. Right. And I was like, well, and like, um, what are the X game athletes? Like all of these really cool people. And I was like, what am I, I don't know what I'm doing here, but like old me would have felt so out of place in that environment or so self-conscious about my body. And I was just like, no, I deserve to be here just like everyone else. And I'm going to have the best time. Um, and I think my biggest joy is just like the mental capacity and space that I gained. I would never have written this book. I would never be living in New York. I would have never 
transformed, changed my life in the ways that I have if it wasn't for body liberation. Like liberation has allowed me to live the life that I live now and to really feel free, right? And to, again, you know, model what it likes to be a free black woman that exists in the world. It's because of liberation that I get to do that. And there's just so much joy that comes with that. And I always say like, what a tragedy would be to spend the most moments of our lives wishing our bodies were something that they weren't, something else than just being like, I'm so grateful for this vessel that I'm existing in and I'm going to live in a way that I have the best experiences I can possibly have in this lifetime and just be grateful that I get to experience it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. And hearing you talk, I'm just, I I don't know if this is true or not. I'm curious to see what you think, but like, there's this feeling that comes up for me. It feels like truth, but that can we be liberated if our, we haven't liberated our bodies? Do you know what I mean? Like, I think we can. And I haven't really thought about this. I haven't thought about this, but like, my first thought is like, I don't know how that feels possible. Right? Because it's so, it's like so core. Like, if I am liberated in my mind, my thinking about systems and oppression, but I'm scared to go to a restaurant, am I liberated? I don't think so. And I often think about this. Because I think that for so many of us, right, we can think back of times when we felt like really accomplished. We did this cool thing. We got the job promotion, all these things. And the thought that's always in our mind is like, oh, but I wish, at least for me, I wish my body looked different though, because then maybe I could feel a little bit better, right? Or if I'm I, I'm having a wedding or I'm doing this thing and, and I'm like, oh, but if my body was just smaller, if I look different, this moment would be a little bit better. And so I, I and thinking through that lens, I don't think it's possible to feel truly liberated in our lives if we, if we have not like actualized body liberation. Yeah. All right. Well, we heard it here first. (laughs) It starts with body liberation. It's, I mean, or it has to be a component of liberatory thinking. I think this is why I get so frustrated. Well, I I don't think, I know this is why I get so frustrated when I see DEI, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion offerings, and they're not talking about sizeism and anti-fat bias. And it's like, well, then you're just ignoring that racism is rooted in anti-fat bias. Like, how can you have a whole thing and not address that? I mean, it just bo- it boggles my mind. But it also speaks to just how incredibly powerful capitalism and diet culture have colluded in order to like never allow us to think that or go there and also like how deeply ingrained it is in all of our minds you know like how deeply ingrained because i oftentimes forget right because i surround myself with people who are very like-minded right and my instagram feed is all people who feel the same and so sometimes i forget right that that's my own little circle and then I get outside of my circle and I'm like, oh, 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 yes. There is so much work to do still, right? And we have, and I was actually talking to, this is like last year probably, I was talking to a fitness company actually around some DEI initiatives they had. And I was like, brought up the point, right? Like, mm, I think we're missing like a really big part of the year. And literally it was like I was speaking another language at first, right? And I was like, oh, I really have to go to the basics here. And they start from ground one or step one explaining all of this. And that's when I was like, oh, yeah, like uh, there's just so much still to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you're such a huge part of that, Chrissy. And I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing. I love that we talked about the other side of liberation, about the joy that it brings. And I'm just so honored to have had this conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. This was so much fun. Like, I honestly, I'm like, oh, this feels like, yes, it feels like we're just like having a conversation over coffee and I could talk all night. Like, it's really, it's been so much. Let's have it. Let's talk again for sure. <laughs> Thanks, Chrissy. Before we go, I'd like to read a poem because poetry can reach our hearts in a different way. Poems can have us feel in a different way. And that's what this podcast is all about, expanding our hearts, deepening our empathy, and inviting in joy. So each week, you get a new poem. Mm, What a wonderful conversation with Chrissy. I feel so lucky to to talk to all these amazing people. Um, I definitely don't take it for granted. 
And part of what I loved about my conversation with Chrissy was the, both the trust and the tenacity that she chatted about. And, you know, trust in herself, trust in a bigger plan, trust in what was showing up, but also not getting too discouraged. Like, I, I think tenacity and trust go hand in hand in a really interesting way because they're two different energies. So yeah, she's got me thinking about that. But it did have me think about this beautiful poem by Ada Limon, which is called Instructions on Not Giving Up. More than the fuchsia funnels breaking out of the crabapple tree, more than the neighbor's almost obscene display of cherry limbs shoving their cotton candy colored blossoms to the slate sky of spring rains, it's the greening of the trees that really gets to me. When all the shock of white and taffy, the world's baubles and trinkets, leave the pavement strewn with the confetti of aftermath, the leaves come, patient, plodding, a green skin growing over whatever winter did to us. A return to the strange idea of continuous living, despite the mess of us, the hurt, the empty. Fine, then, I'll take it, the tree seems to say. A new slick leaf unfurling like a fist to an open palm. I'll take it all. Thank you for joining me today. My hope is that you're feeling a little less alone and a little more seen. So until the next episode, you can find me on Instagram at fatjoy.life, on YouTube at youtube.com slash at fatjoy, and on Patreon at patreon.com slash fatjoy. Please do check out the show notes for how you can connect with my amazing guest and for the links to the poem. All right, lovely. I am sending you off with my best wishes for an abundantly fat joy day. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye-bye.